is a list of my disclosures. I do have involvement with a number of companies involved in advanced therapies. All these are related to research and or uh, medical advisement. The outline of the presentation today is as such, we're going to briefly discuss the central tremor in Parkinson's disease. I think that this is important to begin with so that we all have a background baseline. Then we're going to jump right on into the, an overview of focus ultrasound, uh, FUS, and we're going to talk about patient selection criteria, an overview of the methodology, including the methodology that we use here at the University of Colorado, and then outcome measures. So let's start with central tremor. First of all, there are many different types of tremors. So it's important that you are evaluated by a movement disorder specialist to determine what type of tremor you might have. As you can see here in the upper left panel is an individual that has a prominent rest tremor, that being a Parkinson's tremor. On the upper right panel, you can see somebody who has a functional tremor. These used to be called a psychogenic tremor. Somebody in the bottom left is, a, is an individual with multiple sclerosis who really has an end point tremor, as you can see here with some ataxia, meaning decreased coordination. This individual uh, of note also has quite a bit of dysarthria. This is a much slower tremor. And in comparison, somebody that you see in the bottom right is an individual with dystonic tremor. And this is a type of tremor that involves a change or a jerky like tremor that can change with regards to different postures. So it's helpful to know what type of tremor an individual has. When we talk about a central tremor in 2018, the Movement Disorder Society provided us with some basic uh, definitions. You can see here what the definition is, an isolated tremor of the upper limbs, has to have duration for at least three years. You can uh, have tremor in other locations, and you are not to have any other neurological signs, that being, for example, dystonia, which is abnormal posturing of a muscle group, uh, ataxia, meaning decreased coordination, or Parkinsonism. And we'll cover Parkinsonism in subsequent slides. We're going to first talk about essential tremor. The central tremor tends to be a fairly rhythmic. Uh, tremor that occurs with posturing and or action, meaning when you bring the limb to reach for a glass and bring that glass up to your mouth. It tends not to occur at rest. And as you see here from the individual doing the Archimedes spirals, it's fairly sinusoidal, meaning up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, not very rhythmic, uh, very rhythmical, not very jerky. This is a fairly common neurological disorder, at least 1% of the general population and 5% over the age of 65. Now it does have what we say is a bimodal, i.e. two peaks in its distribution that occurring in the second and then in the sixth decade. And the prevalence of essential tremor of those that are greater than 65 years of age is similar to that of reported to Alzheimer's disease. Now, the circuitry is somewhat complex, but I think it's helpful for us to point out one major component of the circuitry that is causing the tremor, and that is the major relay center of the brain called the thalamus. Within the thalamus, as we break this up into different nuclei, and one of the major nuclei that receives these inputs that are causing tremor is that of the nuclei called the VIM, or ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. This is also, as you can see here, the area that we target uh, with surgery, that being both with DBS as well as with focus ultrasound. I like this slide because it points out a major uh, factor in when I consider treatment. First line treatment for a central tremor is medication. And the first line treatments are that of propanol and primidone. Second line treatments are those that you also see here include topiramate. Also some people will use onisamide, sodal, atenolol, gabapentin, uh, maybe pregabalin and benzodiazepines. When you compare the clinical benefit that these individuals with the quote, first-line treatment medication, it's actually inferior 
to that of deep brain stimulation, which you can see here in the uh, hashed uh, bars. Consequently, when an individual has been on first-line medication treatment, perhaps being a combination of propanol and primidone, and we are not living up to that individual's expectations regarding a functional improvement in their daily lives, I'm already thinking about surgical treatment options. Switching gears now, we're gonna talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease was uh, described back in 1817 by the individual James Parkinson's as the, uh, uh, from his pivotal paper called Shaky Palsy. Parkinson's disease, there are many different criteria that are used for diagnosis, but we tend to diagnose this VI clinically. And that means that the individual tends to must have slowness of movement that we call bradykinesia, and subsequently also have other symptoms, that being, for example, rigidity or muscle stiffness, a rest tremor, as you saw in the previous slide, and or postural instability. We term Parkinsonism to reflect those four cardinal features that I just described, rest tremor, slowness in movement or bradykinesia, rigidity, and postural instability. It's simply easier to say Parkinsonism compared with saying those four cardinal features. Shown here is an individual with Parkinson's disease. You can appreciate that she's got a rest tremor of that left hand and also of her legs. She does have some tremor also on the right hand. However, her symptoms are much more effective on one side of the body compared with the other. And that's very common in Parkinson's disease. You also can see here, when she brings up the hand initially, there's really no tremor. That's a key distinction that you can see with the central tremor compared with Parkinson's. However, when she holds up the hand for a period of time, the tremor, quote, re-emerges. And that's a key feature that we use in trying to distinguish the two etiologies. There's slowness of movement, particularly a decrement in the amplitude of the movement as she continues to make the movement. Hence, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as she continues. You can also see some slight posturing of that left hand and a tremor of the left hand. She was also slightly stooped, I should tell you. Now, Parkinson's disease is also a common neurodegenerative disease. It's seen in all races and geographic locations and in both sexes, although it's more prevalent in men compared with women. Its prevalence, as you can see here, is quite high with an estimated even greater number in 2030 within only North America. And it is also a costly disease, as you can see, with the indirect costs of being over $15 billion a year. Now, the circuitry for Parkinson's disease, or I'm going to point out, is also complex. But if we're talking about wanting to treat all of the symptoms of Parkinsonism, with the exception of postural stability, one area of the brain that individuals target is that of the GPI, or pallidum, that you can see here. And that's going to be important as we talk about how does this relate to focus ultrasound. I'll point out that we're not talking here about tremor-predominant Parkinson's disease. For tremor-predominant Parkinson's disease, if you want to treat the tremor, the target again is the VIM, the same as what we discussed in the previous slides when we were talking about a central tremor. So a central tremor and tremor-predominant Parkinson's disease, the target is within the thalamus, that being the VIM. If you want to target the other symptoms of slowness of movement, stiffness, i.e. rigidity, and tremor, the target tends to be, or one of the targets is the GPI, and that's one of the targets that we'll talk about with focus ultrasound. Now, the definition of advanced Parkinson's disease, there really is no clear definition, but one that is commonly used is that when the individual develops motor complications, despite optimal medication treatment. Motor complications are defined by the individual having one or both symptoms, that being motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Starting with uh, motor fluctuations, that includes when the individual has on and off symptoms. So when they take their medication, they feel very good. 
However, over the period of time, those symptoms uh, wear off and then they feel slow, stiff, uh, rest tremor uh, re recurrents. Subsequently, they take the medication about three hours thereafter or so, they feel good again, lasting several hours, and then boom, they're feeling bad again. And they do that throughout the day. Dyskinesias are defined by having irregular movements that are wiggly-like movements. And you can think of, for example, Michael J. Fox, when he presented many years ago to Congress, uh, those are dyskinesias. Those tend to occur with the combination of the medication in an advanced stage of the disease. Again, I tend to think about these treatments much sooner. So when the individual starts having motor complications, that's already when I'm starting to talk about these surgical treatment options. Now, it might not be for one or two years before we really think that they're an ideal candidate or the patient is really considering that these treatment options are uh, best for him or her, but at least we have the conversation early uh, in their course of the disease. So with now having that baseline understanding of the central tremor and Parkinson's disease, we're going to jump right into talking about uh, focus ultrasound. Now, focus ultrasound has many names already, that being called MRI-guided focus ultrasound, high-intensity focus ultrasound. Yes, there is a low-intensity focus ultrasound, but we're, focus we're only going to be discussing the high-intensity focus ultrasound for the remainder of the presentation and or simply it's also turned focus ultrasound. For the remainder of the presentation, as I've been doing, I'm gonna address this really for simplicity as focus ultrasound. Focus ultrasound involves providing ultrasound waves that all converge upon a common point. Now, there are 1,024 elements, as you can see here, that are uh, a half sphere over the head of the individual. And by having all these elements, that emit ultrasound rays, they can converge on one common point. And where they converge can create heat. And that heat is what we can monitor and measure during a sonication to then create a high enough temperature to create essentially a burn. And we'll cover that in subsequent slides. As I mentioned, the main target for tremor and for tremor predominant Parkinson's disease is that of the VIM that you can see here. For the other symptoms of Parkinsonism, again, it tends to be the globus pallidus if we're talking specifically about focus ultrasound. Now, what are some of the benefits of focus ultrasound? Well, first of all, there's no incisions, okay? It doesn't involve placement of a uh, burr hole, for example, through the skull to be able to have access to the brain. It's performed in an outpatient setting. After having the focus ultrasound, the patient goes home that same day. We perform it awake. There's no general anesthesia. And as you'll see, we're able to obtain real-time thermal measurements. And this is important as we're trying to evaluate if we're creating that heat exactly at the target that we want it to be at. We can also perform low temperature sonications that I'll cover to evaluate for clinical benefit, but also to ensure that we're not inducing any adverse effects. And what's really exciting for everyone is the results are immediate. Right there on the table, you can see that the tremor goes away. Now, MRI-guided focus ultrasound, focus ultrasound is FDA approved. You can see here, with regards to medication refractory essential tremor, it's actually approved back in 2016 for one side of the brain. Recently, it was approved for both sides of the brain to be performed, left side brain, right side body, right side brain, consequently left side body. However, it must be separated by at least nine months between each operation. Tremor predominant Parkinson's disease is also approved you can see here, I have it as potentially covered by insurance. We ensure that it is covered by insurance prior to actually performing the procedure so that obviously the individual does not get hit with a large bill. And it tends to be we're able to get it approved because most individuals with tremor predominant Parkinson's disease have at least in the past been diagnosed with essential tremor. You can see here also very recently at the end of 2022, Parkinson's disease, okay, we're not talking about tremor predominant, 
predominant Parkinson, we're talking about the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease in targeting that GPI that was also recently approved, although it tends out to be covered by insurance. You can also see some other symptom uh, diseases that are also uh, approved for uh, focus ultrasound. Now, there are a number of resources, but actually one good resource is Insight Tech itself. They have the Connect program, and I know they're continuing to develop this program. They have a website, a telephone number, and even an app. They perform an initial evaluation to see if you could be a candidate, and if they think you might be, they provide your reference to centers, as you can see here, the number of centers throughout the United States, to be able to contact them, to be able to see about learning more about the procedure and considering actually if you're a candidate and undergoing the procedure itself. The success of focus ultrasound really is dependent upon two main factors, that being appropriate patient selection. And I think you got a flavor for that when we're talking about different tremors and making sure that the individual has the correct type of tremor that would respond to the treatment, and also surgical targeting, and we'll cover that in the subsequent slides. Some basic criteria is an individual has to have a dense enough skull. And now what do we mean by that? We're not talking about a thick skull. We're talking about a dense skull. And there's two main reasons for that. One reason is that the ultrasound rays do much better in going through dense material as opposed to very spongy-like material if you got a really thick skull that was very spongy. Uh, and that's also because the skull would absorb the energy if it's very spongy. Think about a sponge absorbing the energy. And unfortunately, if an individual does have a very, not a very dense skull, then that individual A might not be a candidate, or B, they might experience quite a bit of pain going through the procedure because what's happening is you're providing that energy to the skull and the skull obviously being a bone can experience pain. So we calculate, for example, what the density is of the skull prior to the individual obviously going through the procedure. And we do that by the individual getting a CT scan. If an individual has significant gait impairment, then I certainly inform them that there's a risk that this gait impairment could worsen with focus ultrasound. And we take great care in our targeting if the individual uh, has a gait impairment. I might modify the targeting slightly uh, based upon that. And then you can see some somewhat relative exclusion criteria, claustrophobia. Most patients were able to get through that because we have them in the sonication and MRA, and then we pull them right out um, between sonications. Obviously, if they can't remain still during the procedure, if they have uh, metal in their body, they're not. And then obviously, if they've got brain abnormalities or previous brain surgery, uh, they might not be a good candidate. You can also see uh, the definitions with the central tremor and tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. They obviously have to be uh, tried on medication and deemed to be medication refractory. And also, they have to be of a certain age. I think when we talk about the procedure, it's easiest to actually track a patient of ours throughout this procedure for you to understand what was the experience. So the first patient, well, the patient we'll discuss is an 82-year-old right-handed woman who noted they have significant right-hand posturing and action tremor with the onset of 15 years ago. You can see the medications that she's been on, yes, propanol and primidone, but also she's tried botulinum toxin injection and using a modified utensils, that being either heavier weighted utensils or, for example, the oscillatory spoon that some of you might know about. Her goals overall were to improve her writing. She used to be a teacher of note, and she just wanted to be able to eat, cut, use a fork, for example, to feed herself. She presented to our center, this University of Colorado Advanced Therapies Movement Disorder Center, ATMD. She was very reluctant to, quote, have surgery, given her age and other comorbidities. And she really was not interested in having multiple follow-up visits, i.e. seeing the doctor a number of times, uh, which is somewhat of a requirement for DBS programming as you have to have multiple programming sessions thereafter. You can also see her of note, 
her handwriting. And we'll look at her handwriting here. The handwriting was fairly illegible. As you can see, it's very sinusoidal. She might have a little bit of tremor also on the left hand, but it was so predominant on the right hand. And really, that was the hand she used for her everyday life activities. She's simply writing the uh, question saying, um, writing the sentence here saying, this is a sample of my best handwriting. And I think many of you might also uh, perform this. And again, this is the Archimedes spirals that she's trying to complete, staying between those two lines to complete a nice spiral. We also have her doing line drawing. And just like you saw in the previous patient, uh, they have quite a bit of a sinusoid uh, um, tremor. She had such a hard time even getting the pen on the paper to get started with just doing a line. You can imagine how difficult that would be for her actually to bring up, for example, a fork to her mouth. So she came in, we evaluated her, she got a CT scan, okay? Her skull density was appropriate. We reviewed with her, um, the procedure, and then we uh, and we'll go through how we do this as well. Uh, in subsequent slides, we, as a team, approved her for focus ultrasound. Now, one important point is the targeting. We spend a lot of time, and a number of centers also do this. Spend a lot of time and actually ensuring that we're targeting the right area, and this is where the predominant amount of time is spent. There are a number of different ways to target the BIM, and I'm going to go through those ways, and we use all of these to ensure that we're accurately targeting uh, the BIM. The first way is by indirect coordinates, and what does that mean? That means, as you see here, the X, Y, Z coordinates on the bottom left, and we take that, for example, either from a point being the posterior commissure, and we say, okay, we're going to go for example, six millimeters uh, anterior, uh, approximately 12 millimeters lateral, and right at the point of the SI or above um, the ACPC line. And that's where we're going to sonicate in every patient. That doesn't reflect the obvious individuality that we all have with regards to our brains. Another method that you see here is that by an atlas. This is a uh, atlas that is drawn, the computer thinks, is drawn to best match what the computer thinks is the BIM. I should point out here, you can't see the BIM on an MRI. As you can see, there's no identifiable area saying this is the BIM here on this T2 MRI. So you can use an atlas, that the computer generates thinking that this is uh, likely uh, the area that we want to target. We also use DTI, and that means tractography. And this is individualized to the, to the person. And in this, what we're looking at is different tracks of the individual, okay? So for example, in pink here, we have the motor tract that we call the cortical spinal tract. This is, the area, this is the tract that's involved in movement. We want to avoid that area because if we knock out, i.e. burn that area, and what I'm really referring to is we're inducing a stroke, by the way, then the individual won't be able to move. In blue is the sensory pathway. If we lesion or expand the lesion too far this way, the individual might not be able to feel. So we want to avoid that pathway. In comparison, in yellow, this is the dentorubral thalamic tract. This is the area of the brain that we do want to target. This is that area of the brain that is involved in the tremor. And you can see here, we get it in three different planes. This allows us to make sure that we're targeting A, the area that we want to target, individualized to that person, as well as ensuring that we're avoiding areas that are in close proximity that we very much want to avoid. I'll also point out 
as I've kind of stated already, the person's symptoms might also dictate where I may target. If the individual has any evidence of dystonia or quote dystonic features to their essential tremor, I might choose the target a little bit in front of the VIM, that being in the VOP, as studies have shown that this might be a superior target in these individuals who also manifest some um, dystonic tremor. I also will point out that this is the area of the brain that I also tend to target if the individual has tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. So we're taking also the patient's clinical presentation into our targeting planning. I tend to do all that planning um, days to even a week prior to the individual coming in my focus ultrasound so that I already know what we're going to be doing uh, during the procedure, as well as it helps speed up the day. So upon the individual getting approved, and we'll talk about what that how that approval process uh, is proceeded, uh, the individual comes into clinic, uh, actually comes into the MRI suite. And I'll point out that we ask the individual to be off of their tremor medications, that being, for example, uh, propanol, primidones, and nisamide, topiramate, at least 12 hours or even 24 hours prior to performing the focus ultrasound. And that's because I want that tremor to be as bad as it possibly can be so that I can see if we're making a significant improvement in that uh, patient's tremor. We do repeat some portions of the neurological examination. We obtain IV access as well in the event that we have to give some medications. For example, if blood pressure goes up, we have to lower the blood pressure a little bit, or the individual has a little bit of pain, and we can eliminate some of that uh, with some IV anti-pain medication. I also pre-treat patients with an anti-emetic as well as analgesics, i.e. I give them some uh, adoncitron as well as I give my patients some Tylenol, essentially. The head is completely shaved, and I mean shaved like a big razor on a man's face. Okay. And you can see the individual here. Now her head is completely shaved. We place a head frame, and that's shown here. And these are four screws that are hand tightened into the skin. You can think about like a pencil being tightened into the skull. We numb up the skull, obviously numb up the skin so that it's not painful for the individual. And that is important because we don't want the head to be moving during the procedure itself. Then we place a silicon membrane, as you can see here, that's fairly tight around the individual. And we position the patient to the scanner. And we also teach the individual how to push a stop button that will eliminate the sonications. I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead to show you what, what this looks like here and come back. So the individual is now on the table. You can see here that she has the head frame here. And this is that membrane. And the reason why the membrane is attached is because it's connected to what we call the transducer. And that transducer is right here. That's what's delivering that uh, hopefully over 700 up to even uh, preferably 900 elements of sonication. That area where the uh, membrane is to the transducer is filled with circulating cool water. And that's important because we want to make sure the skin and the skull remain cool when we're delivering these ultrasound waves that can create heat. In addition, the ultrasound waves, obviously, as many of you may know, ultrasound waves travel better through a liquid media compared with skin. Think about when uh, mothers are getting ultrasound, they often have a gel that is attached to them. The planning stage is quite complex. A lot of the time, the individual is sitting there saying, what is going on? Why is this taking so much time? But in essence, what we're doing here is we're lining up the CT scan MRI and pulling on all those pre-op plannings. We can evaluate in real time a heat map that is being generated by the ultrasound, and that's shown here. And we can look at what does that ultrasound look like as far as its distribution. After each sonication, I will evaluate the individual. I'm looking for any adverse effects as well as clinical benefit here. So I do a fairly detailed neurological exam. I'm looking for weakness, changes in sensation, looking at any changes in coordination, 
And then I jump into, are we seeing an improvement here with regards to tremor control? We first perform a minimum of three alignment sonications. These alignment sonications ensure that the heat map is being appropriately positioned within the X, Y, and Z coordinates. I will examine the patient thereafter. And then subsequently what we do is we perform a low temperature. So I'm stunning the tissue prior to um, creating a permanent burn of that tissue. And that's important because if I'm inducing any adverse effects, I certainly wanna know about it prior to making a permanent lesion because that might change where I want to position. In addition, if I do a low treatment and I'm not seeing any clinical benefit, then we're going to need to think about, are we in really the optimal position here? And that's being shown here when we have alignment, as you can see here, the temperature range, verification, tend to use really low treatment here. And then we want to make sure we get somewhere around 56 degrees Celsius. That's over 130 degrees Fahrenheit. When we date to 56 degrees uh, Celsius, that ensures that we likely have created a permanent lesion, permanent burn. We tend to do a total of six to seven uh, sonications, okay? And that does include those three alignment sonications, okay? So there might be three to four alignment sonications. Again, that's when you're just low temperature, making sure that heat map is exactly where you like it. The individual typically doesn't feel anything during that time period. And then we do a low treatment, one or two of those, and or one or two higher treatments on occasions to really create that burn. You can see this individual, as I was showing you um, uh, throughout this entire case, her pre-op. Then you can see after she's had her alignment sonications and her, we did a total of four. And you see there's some notable improvement here. That gives us um, a hint that this might be a very good target. Subsequently, you can see at this sonication what her tremor control was. After we've performed what we think we completed the sonications, we got a really good treatment outcome. We don't see any adverse effects. We think that we're completely done here at this point. There's no need to consider sonicating anywhere else within the brain. We have the patient come off of the table. I remove the head frame, I remove the diaphragm, and then we obtain an MRI right then and there because the MRI machine, after all, is, is right next to the individual. And the reason why I get an MRI right then and there is because I want to ensure that I see a hole, that I see that we created a stroke, a focal stroke. I want to make sure that we didn't just create swelling and that as swelling resolves, the tremor would return. I want to know that there's a hole there and that the tremor, I'm more confident, is truly gone. In addition, I want to see if there's any blood. Very common and actually encouraging to see a little bit of blood product within the lesion. And I also take that MRI and merge that with my pre-plan because I want to see, does this align with what we had intended to do? And you can see here in this individual, the yes, we did indirect targeting, so we can know where we are with relation to indirect targeting, but then we also can look at where we were with the atlas, and we can also see that this lines up very nicely with the tractography, that being the DRTT, and that, by the way, I'll point out, it did not expand into the sensory pathway, nor into the motor pathway, that being the cortical spinal tract. So that's all nice, but then I also want to see the patient the next day. And want to, I want to see how well did we really do, as well as answer any and all additional questions. So this is her the following day after I performed the MRI-guided focus ultrasound. I'll point out that her handwriting, you might say, is quite slow. But as she was saying, she has not been able to handwrite like this for many, many years, so she's kind of already relearning how to handwrite herself. And remember, she used to be a school teacher. I'll note that she still has the tremor in the left hand, and that was not treated. And we were really aiming to improve the function of that right hand.
You can see here her Archimedes spirals. which is significantly improved compared with her ability to perform this task prior. Her straight line drawing, she's able to get the pen right on the paper right away, and voila. And this is just the before and after pictures. You already saw both of these, including when she was performing this. So how does this align with this one patient that I just wanted to take you through with regards to the outcomes? Well, we tend to see about a 50% improvement of hand tremor, 70% or so improvement of the postural tremor. Disability, because they're so disabled because of this tremor, is also significantly improved and the quality of life is improved by 40 to 50 percent. Those are huge numbers. But I also want to point out that these numbers, as you can see, are sustained out to at least three years. And there's smaller studies that even demonstrate that it's extended even out to five years. So if we're able to ensure that we've really created that focal stroke right there, the tremor tends to not uh, return. Now, there could be a progression of their central tremor, but the tremor that the individual actually had at that time is significantly improved and appears, at least in these studies, to be sustained. We have a similar finding when we look at tremor predominant Parkinson's disease, that looking only at their tremor component with a sustained benefit in their tremor and a significant reduction of their tremor as well. If we're talking about bilateral, focus ultrasound, you can also see further improvement of their overall tremor, as one would expect, i.e. improvement of both the left and right hand tremor. But I'll point out that we must also be very cognizant about any potential adverse effects that might occur. You can see here in these nine patients, in one of the first studies that was really performed with bilateral focus ultrasound, some of the impairment that we can see here in gait, as well as what we can see here potentially in an impairment of some coordination. There are notable adverse effects, and you can see these here, that being, for example, numbness, decreased coordination, and balance, and steadiness as well, and muscle weakness. A lot of these are associated with the lesion expanding beyond the target area. And I'll expand upon some of these might be really related to the edema that has occurred that tend to, as you can see here, resolve within several weeks. But if it's got that hole, i.e. that stroke is extended beyond your target area, then some of these could become permanent. That's why we take such great care in ensuring that we're targeting exactly where we want to be. I also will point out that these studies that demonstrate these adverse effects were really when we first started performing this procedure. And there's been a number of changes that have been done that I think have really potentially resulted in a reduction of the adverse effects that people are now seeing. For example, we used to wanna be able to get over 60 degrees Celsius. It's quite high. In comparison, now we tend to wanna to be above 55, 56 degrees Celsius. So we've lowered the temperature, noting that we don't need to get to that high temperature to create that burn. And in fact, if you increase even beyond, you might actually expand that lesion where you don't want it to occur. We used to also perform a huge number of sonications. If you look at some of the literature, it was even up to 16 sonications compared with, for example, as I mentioned, six or seven today. We also used to target right at ACPC. And basically what I'm saying here is we changed our targeting slightly in general to try to avoid some of that decreased coordination and gait impairment. And as I've also mentioned, our center and some other centers have also implemented tractography that we also think has improved our ability to individualize the targeting. Now, everything we talked about thus far was regarding tremor, okay? That being for a central tremor and for tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. What about that 
thing that you were talking about being Parkinsonism, that being the rigidity and slowness of movement as well, when you mention that target called the GPI. And we call that when you create a lesion there, a stroke there, a pallidotomy. What is the data with regards to this? Because this has also been, as you note, recently approved. This study actually just came out very recently. You can see here the number of individuals with Parkinson's disease who had a focus ultrasound performed, uh, N is equal to 65 here on that top uh, left panel. And there is a number of individuals, 22, who also received a sham, meaning a fake focus ultrasound. So they went through the whole procedure. They thought that they had focus ultrasound. They didn't know it themselves, whether they did or didn't. Um, and then we look at what the clinical outcomes are here. And we looked at clinical outcomes uh, at three months. And I must admit, I was really hopeful that these results would be much more promising compared with what we're seeing here. 30% of individuals okay, really did not have any response at all. That's a really high number, in fact, in my opinion. And when we even look at what was defined as a clinical response, the bar was set fairly low. They just had to have an improvement of the dyskinesias or a slight notable improvement of rigidity, slowness of movement, and some tremor. You can see here, however, that it was relatively safe and well tolerated. Consequently, I think that if somebody is really interested in having a pallidotomy performed, they really need to discuss this in great detail uh, with their clinician to have realistic expectations about what the outcomes may be. I want to provide some distinguishing points about us as a center. First of all, we're a very comprehensive advanced therapies movement disorder center. We have a very large team. Our team consists of uh, four movement disorder neurologists, two neurosurgeons who are stereotactic functional neurosurgeons, meaning this is mainly what they perform, physical medicine, rehabilitation, neuropsychology, neurophysiology, uh, nurse navigators, PT, OT, speech therapy as well. Um, when an individual comes into our center, and this is a list of all the personnel, they're first evaluated by myself. If we think that they're a good candidate and we want to go, i.e. Uh, I, the patient, the patient's family, myself think that they might be a good candidate, then what we do is we obtain that CT scan. Thereafter, after obtaining the CT scan, what we do is we just, I discuss the patient with the entire team. And you can see the individuals here, we do this virtually, of course, because we want to take a team approach to ensure that we thought about everything and that there's no other concerns. Subsequently, I inform the patient as to whether they're a good candidate, yes or no. And if they are, then we uh, move forward with uh, the procedure as I've already outlined. And that's what I mean by saying we have a patient care conference where we take a team approach and uh, discussing patients. So although you're seeing one person, it's actually a complete team that's being involved in the decision making. I also do note that we do have quite a bit of experience with targeting because we do a lot of deep brain stimulation as well. And we implement DTI uh, in what we think is improving our targeting. I also will note that I perform a lot of examinations after the sonication, I'm not just looking at the tremor, I'm looking at a number of different features and ensure that I'm really targeting that area exactly where we want it to be and avoiding areas we want to be able um, to prevent uh, stimulate uh, sonication from approaching. I think it's a very exciting uh, technique. I think the indications for focus ultras, by the way, are gonna expand dramatically. As you can see here, just the annual number of thalamales that has skyrocket high from 2016 up to 2020, and it's even greater than this now. Um, and also you can see the huge number of explosion of publications that have also come out with regards to the research um, in focus ultrasound. We're gonna have improved procedural techniques and you can already see those as from what I've discussed, an increased number of indications, 
and hopefully improvement of our insurance coverage. Well, I thank you all for your attention today on a Sunday. Um, in addition, I provide you with a direct email address that you can send an email directly to us and we'll answer all of your questions and or if you wanna be able to be seen at our center. I know there's a number of questions and I'm happy to take them at this time.